Information concerning the Essenes prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls comes to us from two ancient scholars, both of whom were contemporaries of the first century Essenes, Josephus Flavius and Philo of Alexandria. Josephus was born at Jerusalem in 37 AD, the greatest historian of the Jews in that period. Philo was the greatest Jewish philosopher of that time. Both men had personal knowledge of the ancient Essenes. Both scholars make clear that the Essenian roots are incredibly ancient. Josephus declares that the Essenes have existed from time immemorial and countless generations. Philo agrees, calling the Essenes the most ancient of all initiates, with a teaching perpetuated through an immense space of ages. Records of the Essene way of life have come down to us from writings of their contemporaries. Pliny the Roman naturalist and others spoke of them variously as a race by themselves, more remarkable than any other in the world. The oldest of the initiates, receiving their teaching from Central Asia, teaching perpetuated through an immense space of ages, constant and unalterable holiness." Unquote. Josephus and Philo, as well as several other ancient writers, including Pliny the Elder, are in consensus on two points in regards to the origins of the Essenes. Their origin is lost in prehistory, with certain ancient legends linking them with Enoch. And secondly, there was a major remanifestation of the Essenes by Moses at Mount Sinai. Enoch lived many centuries before Moses in the fifth chapter of the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Enoch is described as the seventh from Adam which means he was born seven generations after Adam, since seven in Essene numerology is the number of perfection. It is no mere coincidence that Enoch represents the seventh generation of humanity. He represents perfected <coughs> humanity. While much of the Enochian legend cited above is found only in Essene Kabbalah texts, it stems directly from the Bible. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. The fact that Enoch was considered the founder or initiator of the Essenes can even be seen in his name. The word Enoch means in Hebrew, founder, initiator, centralizer. The Essenes have their roots in Egypt during the late 18th dynasty. These were equated with purity and the polarity of light as opposed to darkness. It is unclear as to exactly when that brotherhood, as it is called, was formed, but many of the rules and regulations appear to have been formulated by Pharaoh Tumutsi III. The aim of this group, of this movement, of this brotherhood, was to preserve the great knowledge attained by the wisest of Egypt. It could in some ways be seen as a school of philosophy. Students from around the globe traveled to Egypt in order to study under their directorship. The name is seen, is thought to derive from the Egyptian Kashai, meaning secret. There is also a Jewish word Sai, meaning secret or silent, which would naturally translate as a scene. The Jewish historian Josephus found that the Egyptian symbols for light and truth were represented in the word chosen, which in Greek also translates to esen, leading to speculation that the Essenes may in fact be the chosen ones mentioned in the Bible. Chosen is derived from the Aramaic Asaya, meaning physician or healer, a role for which the Essenes were well known and highly respected. The Greek word for physician is of course therapeutai, and for this reason they were known as the therapeutai within the Greek-speaking world. 
Now, the Essenes refer to themselves as Esania, meaning sons of the sun. This may help to explain why one of the most important movers in the early formation of this group, of this school, the so-called Pharaoh Akhenaten, great-great-grandson of Tumose III, abandoned the old gods in favor of the Aten, as represented by the solar disk. The best known of the Essene communities was undoubtedly Qumran, near the Dead Sea, where the famous Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1947. So far, over 800 scrolls have been found, ranging from hymns and prayers, community rules and copies of various biblical texts. The most unusual of these, the Copper Scroll, was found in cave number three, and appeared to be an ancient treasure map listing 64 different caches, much of which are believed to have come from the Temple of Jerusalem. Many of the sites mentioned in the scroll have since been excavated, but no treasure has been found. Scholar and author Robert Feather believes that the reason for this is that archaeologists have been looking in the wrong place, or to be more precise, the wrong country. He believes that the treasure is not to be found in Israel, but rather in Egypt, at the ruins of Amarna, Akhenaten's capital city. Moses is said to have been a pupil of Akhenaten. The Essenes claim to have received much of their esoteric teaching from Moses. When the Copper Scroll was finally translated by John Allegro in addition to Hebrew writing, it was also found to contain 14 letters from the Greek alphabet interspersed throughout the text. When Feather looked at these in more detail, he found that when put together, they spelled in the Greek the name for Akhenaten. So who was this Pharaoh, different from all others? One of the most critical links between various religions, revealing that the truth they teach is the same, is seen in the little known fact that Hebrew spiritual knowledge originated in the teachings of ancient Egypt. This assertion would tie the teachings of the Torah to the source of all the primary streams of esoteric knowledge available to humanity. Egypt was the location of the great library of Alexandria and the center of esoteric schools that attracted the likes of Plato. This oneness of truth is a most compelling idea in our day and age when the reality of the global community and our interconnection across nations and cultures is an obvious daily event. It carries the seeds of reconciliation, understanding, peace for our tormented world. Our work is to find the keys to the meaning of these ancient teachings that reveal universal truth which sets us free. The sacred wisdom of the Hebrews clearly dates back to more ancient sources. This connection is no longer merely the opinion of metaphysical organizations, but proven by modern biblical scholarship to be true. A classic example of this phenomenon is found in Psalm 104, the famous Pearl of the Psalter. Scholars point out that despite its parallels with Genesis 1, this psalm does not show dependence on the story of creation. It comes from... <laughs> It excels even Genesis 1 in richness and imagination and is an older version dating back from when the sagas of Genesis and Exodus were still in the process of flux and growth, not having as yet received their fixed literary form. Scholars tell us that Psalm 104 is not an original composition by a Hebrew psalmist, but is derived from and owes its magnificent spirit to the hymn of the sun, attributed to Pharaoh Ignaton, Akhenaten, the noted Egyptologist Hugo Gressman, observed that in their ideas about God and the intimate relationship that human beings may cultivate with their creator, 
The Egyptians of the 18th and 19th dynasties were far in advance of the Hebrews of the early monarchical period. Such ideas did not prevail to any extent until the later half of the 8th century BC in the time of Amos and Isaiah, Hezekiah. The opportunity to become acquainted with Egyptian thought and literature was never lacking in Israel. The two countries had commercial and political ties and maintained friendly relations down to 586 BC when the Hebrews were forced into exile. At the time of the Deuteronomic legislation, 622 BC, Egyptians must have lived in considerable numbers in Israel since Deuteronomy 23, 8 and forward states that third generation Egyptians may be admitted to the community of Yahweh. It is well known that for two millennia, Egypt exercised a powerful influence over Palestine. The two cultures intermingle to such an extent that hundreds of Hebrew loan words are found in the Egyptian of the New Kingdom. King Solomon married an Egyptian princess, you'll find it in Kings 9. Moses reached a place of considerable social importance in Egypt. The scholar W.F. Albright suggests that Moses' original Torah may well have contained Egyptian elements that were later integrated with native Hebrew conceptions. Moreover, Moses introduced to his people the ancient Egyptian custom of circumcision that was practiced for at least 3,000 years by the Nile dwellers. The fact that Moses adopted as a universal distinguishing mark of the Israelites a sacred Egyptian practice is evidence that he was drawing upon his knowledge of Egyptian religion. Acts 7.22 tells us that Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Among the major influences that can be traced back to Egyptian sources are, one, the concept of the God who is sole creator of everything, and the formula by which his name is derived, who causes to be what comes into existence, which is used repeatedly in the hymn to Amun, 15th century BC. Secondly, the concept of a single God and the establishment of a doctrine based on monotheism. Third, the recognition of a universal cosmic dominion of the deity. Furthermore, Moses' Torah translates as teaching, a word which is used exclusively in the slightly earlier system known as Zbayet, teaching originated by Akhenaten. Through the medium of Semitic scribes who studied Egyptian and learned their trade in the Egyptian writing schools, many of the ideas and literary artifices contained in poems of the 18th and 19th dynasties passed into Palestine. Extracts of these works may have begun to filter into Palestine even before the reign of Hezekiah who initiated the recopying of Egyptian poems and treaties that may well have stimulated the reform movement in Judah. Egyptian influences penetrated Hebrew thought to such an extent that we find its influence even in the New Testament. In the myth of Isis, who was known as the mother of God, her divine child Horus is miraculously conceived and born in a stable. The young pharaoh Ignaton, or Akhenaten, inspired a universalism not found before in the 3,000 years of Egyptian religion. He attempted to create a world religion and displace not only the inherent nationalism in Egyptian religion, but all the gods in favor of a single universal God, the Aton. Ignaton was the first individual we know of in history to shape his times by rejecting the sordidness of religion and the indecent wealth and lavish rituals of the temples. Some scholars suggest that he was the first person to understand rightly the meaning of divinity. For instance, Akhenaten forbade his artists from making images of Aton on the grounds that the true God had no form. 
He understood God as a life-giving, intangible essence. The symbol of the aton, the sun disk from which diverging beams radiate downward, each ending in a human hand, was not worshipped. Rather, the divinity was the power that produced and sustained the energy of the sun. This solar theology was closely identified with the development of the moral consciousness of Egypt. Aton was to be found not in battles and victories, but in flowers and trees, in all forms of life and growth. The divinity was the creative and nourishing heat of the sun that gives life to all that exists. With this depiction of the deity, Akhenaten formulated the profound idea of God's immanence. The presence of the divine within matter, and specifically in human form. For the first time in history, God was conceived as a formless being. Ignaton's God was an intangible essence, the energetic force that acted through the sun. The creator who held all things in his hands. He was both transcendent and imminent, original causation and continuous presence. The omnipresence and benevolent quality of the sun evolved into an understanding of Aton as a compassionate mother-father figure of creation. There was no mention of hatred, jealousy, or wrath, of hell or of judgment of God. For Aton was called the Lord of Love. The Essenes were to all extent and purposes a very advanced and highly evolved race of people. There were those who lived in small enclosed settlements and shared a communal way of life in nature where everyone was equal. Others lived in large communities, buildings, near cities, many of which served as inns and hospices. It is to one of these hospices near Bethlehem that Mary, mother of Jesus, was brought to give birth. Much of their time was devoted to the study of ancient texts, various branches of the healing arts. There were also those who traveled far and wide, circulating news and information throughout the various centers that they maintained. Two principal centers were at Lake Moriris in Egypt and in Palestine at Engadi near the Dead Sea. In addition to this, for many centuries they maintained a great library and school of learning near Mount Carmel. It is here that many of their great leaders, including possibly John the Baptist, are said to have been educated. Like many of the ancient Gnostic groups, the Essenes believed that humankind was made up of three aspects, body, mind, and emotions. The ultimate goal of the individual was the evolution not only within him or herself, but also in regards to the planet and universe as a whole. The body was the outer means through which this was expressed, while the mind was seen as the inner manifestation and creator of thoughts and emotions which the body then responded to and acted upon. Thought was therefore considered to be the highest, most powerful force in the universe as it was seen as the instigator of both feeling and action. The Essenes therefore trained themselves to harness this power in a positive way, knowing that each thought affected the lives, affected the lives of everyone on the planet through the vibrations they sent into the collective unconscious. Qumran communities generally believed to have been established around the year 130 BC in order to prepare for the imminent arrival of the expected Messiah. <coughs> the royal house of David from which the true leader of Israel was expected to come had long since passed into the hands of outsiders while the high priesthood was both culturally and politically more Roman and Greek than Jewish. It therefore made sense according to some scholars, for the Messiah to come not from these sources, but rather from among the Essenes. Here now, 
words from their own writings, from the manual of discipline found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. The law was planted in the garden of the brotherhood to enlighten the heart of man and to make straight before him all the ways of true righteousness. A humble spirit, an even temper, a freely compassionate nature, an eternal goodness and understanding and insight and mighty wisdom which believes in all God's works and a confident trust in his many blessings and a spirit of knowledge in all things of the great order loyal feelings towards all the children of truth a radiant purity which loathes everything impure a discretion regarding all the hidden things of truth and secrets of inner knowledge unquote ancient writings since the archaeological discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls beginning in 1946 the word is seen has made its way around the world often raising a lot of questions many people were astonished to discover that 2,000 years ago a community of holy men and women living together equally carried within themselves what certainly appeared to them as the seeds of Christianity in the future of Western civilization. The Essenes consider themselves the guardians of the divine teaching. They had in their possession a great number of very ancient manuscripts, some of them going back to the dawn of time. A large portion of the school members spent their time decoding them, <laughs> translating them into several languages and reproducing them in order to perpetuate and preserve this advanced knowledge. They considered this work to be a sacred task. The Essenes considered their brotherhood, sisterhood, as the presence on earth of the teaching of the sons and daughters of God. They were the light which shines in the darkness and which invites the darkness to change itself into light. Thus for them, when a candidate asked to be admitted to their school, it meant that within him or her, a whole process of awakening of the soul was set in motion. The Essenes differentiated between the souls which were sleeping, drowsy, and awakened. Their task was to help, to comfort, and to relieve the sleeping souls, to try to awaken the drowsy souls, and to welcome and guide the awakened souls. Only the souls considered as awakened could be initiated into the mysteries of the brotherhood, sisterhood. The Essenes consider themselves to be a separate people, not because of external signs like skin color, hair color, etc., but because of the illumination of their inner life and their knowledge of the hidden mysteries of nature unknown to other people. A number of contemporary scholars believe that although the Essenes began as an esoteric minority sect within Judaism, they went on to become the very first Christians called Essene Nazarenes or Ebionites. It is quite clear that the headquarters of the entire Essene movement was Mount Carmel in northern Israel, not Qumran in southern Israel, and that Jesus was primarily associated with Carmel. Equally clear is the fact that the northern Essenes in the region of this Mount Carmel were called Nazarenes. The fact that nearly every major event associated with the life of Jesus occurred in northern Israel is strong evidence that Jesus lived most of his life in that area. Only four events of Jesus' life occurred in southern Israel his birth in Bethlehem, his visit to the temple when he was 12, his baptism by John, his final journey to Jerusalem. And each of these events is clearly described as occurring after making a long journey from his home in northern Israel. I'm going to stop here for a moment. Sandy, would you turn on the second light so people can find their way to chairs? I'm seeing people wandering in the dark. We don't want that when we talk about the Essenes. <laughs> the 
There is solid consensus among scholars that John the Baptist was from Qumran. The location of the Jordan River, where tradition tells us John performed his baptisms, is exactly where the Jordan River connects with the Dead Sea, near Qumran. And everything we know about John perfectly matches up with what is known about the Qumran descendants. When the Holy Family returned from Egypt after Herod's death, we are told that they settled in Nazareth. Nazareth is very near this Mount Carmel, the headquarters of the entire Essene movement. However, in those days, some scholars have found that there was no town called Nazareth. Rather, it was simply a cooperative village of Essene Nazarenes. Thus the term Jesus of Nazareth was originally Jesus the Nazarene. And a Nazarene is a northern Essene associated with Mount Carmel, which is why in the New Testament book of Acts, the early Christians are referred to as the sect of the Nazarenes. Jesus the Nazarene has remarkable similarities with the Essene teacher of righteousness. The teacher of righteousness is referred to in the Manual of Discipline and the Damascus document. In the Manual of Discipline, the teacher is associated with the time of the preparation of the way in the wilderness by the teaching of the miraculous mysteries. He is commanded to be zealous for the law and the day of vengeance, conjuring up explicit images of zealots in John 2.27, Jesus has zeal in the temple. In Acts 21.20, James' followers are, quote, zealous for the law. In the Damascus document, the teacher is to walk in the laws until the standing up of the Messiah of Aaron and Israel in the last days. Where standing up can be synonymous with returning, rising, even resurrection. There is a reference in a scroll fragment to the putting to death of the righteous one. Compare this with the passage in James 5, 6, which says, You condemn the righteous one, you put him to death, though he does not resist you. This fragment echoes other themes of and the style of James' epistle, calling for patience and restraint. Even the language, including the use of words like tongue, and vipers are closely similar. Indeed, the tongue imagery of James 3 is used to attack lying adversaries, and the tongue is described by the identical, though common enough, expression, the stumbling block, both in James and in the Essene scroll fragment. Such examples are beyond coincidence. In James 2:20 20 to 24, the man of emptiness knows not that a man was justified by his works and faith without works is dead, a plain contradiction of Paul's message that faith alone brings salvation, now considered to be so much at the heart of Christianity. So scholars believe that James is an Essene document only slightly edited by later Christians. Other fragments also suggest that the Nazi, the prince of the community, was put to death, though it could be interpreted that the Nazi put someone else to death. The context is that of the revered quotation from Isaiah. A rod shall rise from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow from his roots, referring to the Messiah. Elsewhere, a messianic figure will overthrow the evil generation. This fragment possibly refers to a crucifixion. The scholar Dupont Summer summarizations of these remarkable similarities between the teacher of righteousness and Jesus the Christ are as follows. Both were martyred prophets subsequently revered by their followers as the suffering servant. Both preached penitence, poverty, humility, love of one's neighbor and chastity. Both prescribed observance of the law of Moses. 
Both were the elect of God and the Messiah, the Redeemer of the world. Both were opposed by the priests, the Sadducees, condemned and murdered. Both seemed to found a church of believers who thought he would return in glory, whose central rite was a sacred meal presided over by priests, and whose members held goods in common and believed in such communal living. Both will be the supreme judge at the last judgment. Both apparently predicted the fall of Jerusalem. Other <coughs> commonalities between Christian and Essene communities and teachings. They both believe in baptism. One scholar tells us the manual of discipline ordained that the initiate, quote, shall be made clean by the humble submission of his soul to all the precepts of God, unquote, but only after, quote, his flesh is sprinkled with purifying water and sanctified by cleansing water. The <coughs> earliest Christians held all things in common. The manual of discipline states that all shall bring their knowledge, powers, and possessions into the community. They shall eat in common and pray in common and that a new member's property shall be merged to the community. The early church in Jerusalem was led by the twelve apostles, still twelve even after Judas had died, showing that the apostles were not particular persons specifically, but positions to be filled when vacant. Fourteen, possibly fifteen apostles are mentioned in the Gospels, of whom Peter, James, and John held special responsibility. The community was led among the Essenes by a council of twelve people, apparently with three priests having special responsibility. Both the Essene community and the first Christians were messianic. The Christians regarded Jesus as the Messiah. The community had their teacher of righteousness with a similar history. Both communities also used the same phraseology. Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. An exact expression of the community's beliefs about itself, for they call themselves the poor and the meek. And they were preparing themselves to inherit the earth when God's kingdom on earth was created. Many other instances can be quoted, especially from Matthew, which was the one closest in language to the Aramaic. Both communities originally cleaved rigidly to the law of Moses and so evidently to Jesus because he says in the Sermon on the Mount that he was, has not come to destroy the law but to fulfill it. If the confusion of the timing of the Last Supper in the Bible is anything to go by, the calendar used by Jesus did not match the official Jewish one. The community used a solar rather than the official lunar calendar, which might have allowed Jesus and his disciples to have had their Passover meal a day earlier so that he was crucified before Passover started. Both communities had an identical ritual meal. The Christian one supposedly, uh, specially instituted by Jesus at the Last Supper, the community one laid down in the manual of discipline in which the priest shall, quote, bless the first fruits of the bread and new wine, unquote. After which the Messiah, who is present in spirit, extends his hand over the bread that they might begin. Both communities refer to their leader as master. Both communities held an important gathering at Pentecost. New Testament scholars believe that John was the last of the Gospels, written and strongly influenced by Persian religion and Platonic philosophy. From the scrolls, however, some scholars now take a different view. John seems to follow some of the tradition of the Essenes. John has the conflict of light and darkness, and expressions like the light of life, children of light, walking in darkness, spirit of truth, and eternal life, all of which occur in the manual of discipline. John has the words, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. The manual of discipline has the following, and by his knowledge everything has been brought into being, 
and everything that is he established for his purpose and apart from him nothing is done. Particularly impressive is, this, is that similarity between Matthew 25, 35, 36 with a passage from the testament of Joseph. The latter has lines like I was beset by hunger and the Lord himself nourished me. I was sick and the Lord visited me. I was alone and God comforted me. Well, Matthew has, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was sick and you visited me. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. The Essenes lived on the shores of lakes and rivers, away from cities and towns mostly, and practiced a communal way of life, as mentioned, sharing equally in everything. They were mainly agriculturalists, having a vast knowledge of crops and soil and climatic conditions, which enabled them to grow a great variety of fruits and vegetables in a comparatively desert area and with a minimum of labor. They had no servants or slaves and were said to have been the first people to condemn slavery both in theory and practice. There were no rich and no poor among them, both conditions being considered by them as deviations from the law. They established their own economic system based wholly on that law of God and showed that all a human being's food and material needs can be attained without struggle through knowledge of the law. They spent much time in study, both of ancient writings and special branches of learning, such as education, healing, astronomy. They were said to be the heirs of the Chaldean and Persian astronomers and Egyptian arts of healing. They were adept in prophecy, for which they prepared by prolonged fasting. In the use of plants and herbs for healing, they were likewise proficient. They lived a simple, regular life, rising each day before sunrise to study and commune with the forces of nature, bathing in cold water as a ritual and donning white garments. After their daily labor in the fields and vineyards, they partook of their meals in silence, preceding and ending with prayer. They were entirely vegetarian in their eating and never touched flesh foods nor fermented liquids. Their evenings were devoted to study and communion with the heavenly forces. Membership in the Brotherhood was attainable only after a probationary period of a year and three years of initiatory work, followed by seven more years before being given the full inner teaching. From its antiquity, its persistence through the ages, it is evident that this teaching could not have been the concept of any single individual or a particular people, but as the interpretation by a succession of great teachers of the law of the universe, the basic law, eternal and unchanging as the stars in their course, the same now as two or ten thousand years ago, and as applicable today as then. The teaching explains the law, shows how the human being's deviations from it are the cause of all our troubles, and gives the methods by which we can find our way back, our way out of that dilemma. Here now, more writings from the Essenes. This is from the Book of Hymns of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Thou hast made known unto me thy deep, mysterious things. All things exist by thee, and there is none beside thee. By thy law thou hast directed my heart that I set my steps straight forward upon right paths and walk where thy presence is. And from the Manual of Discipline, Dead Sea Scrolls, the law was planted to reward the children of light with healing and abundant peace, with long life, with fruitful seed of everlasting blessings, with eternal joy in immortality of eternal light. The Essenes expressed an exceptional knowledge of psychology in their practice of the communions with the natural and cosmic forces. They knew that human beings have both a conscious and subconscious mind and were well aware of the powers of each. In making one group of their communion the first activity of the morning, they consciously set in motion forces that became the keynote of their whole day. They knew that a thought held strongly enough in the consciousness at the beginning of the day 
influences the individual through all their waking hours. The morning communions consequently opened the mind to harmonious currents which enable them to absorb specific forms of energy into the physical body. The evening communions performed as the last act in the evening before sleep apply the same principle. The Essenes knew that these last thoughts influenced the subconscious mind throughout the night and that the evening commun communions therefore put the subconscious into contact with the storehouse of superior forces. They knew that sleep can therefore become a source of deep knowledge. Listen now to an example of an Essene communion, the angel of love. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of the heavenly Father, and everyone that loveth is born of the heavenly Father and the earthly mother, and knows the angels. <coughs> you shall love one another. As the Heavenly Father has loved you, for the Heavenly Father is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in the Heavenly Father, and the Heavenly Father in him. Let him that love him be as the Son, when he goes forth in his might. Brothers and sisters, be ye all of one mind, having endless love and compassion for one another. They had a profound knowledge of the body as well as of the mind, and they knew the two could not be separated as they form an organic unit, and what affects one affects the other. The scenes antedated the psychosomatic medicine by several thousand years. They paid great att attention to the foods they ate, that they might harmonize with natural law, but they were equally careful of their diet and thought and emotions. They were fully cognizant that man's subconscious mind is like a sensitized plate, registering everything the individual sees or hears that it is therefore necessary to prevent all inferior thoughts such as fear, anxiety, insecurity, hatred, ignorance, egotism, and intolerance from entering the gate of the subconscious mind. The natural law that two things cannot occupy the same space at the same time was clear to them and they knew a person cannot think of two things simultaneously. Therefore, if the mind is filled with positive, harmonious thoughts, those that are negative and inharmonious cannot lodge in it. The Essenes believed human beings should analyze their thoughts and feelings and determine which to give power to, to carry on a desired action and which cause paralysis of spirit. By strengthening all the feelings that create energy and avoiding all those that lead to its exhaustion, the Essenes found that will is acquired. The exercise of will means persevering and patient effort. Through it, an individual's superior feelings will gradually create a vast storehouse of energy and harmony, and the inferior feelings leading to weakness and lack of balance will eventually be eliminated. Through their profound understanding of psychological forces, the Essene communions taught men, men and women the way to freedom, the way of liberation from blind acceptance of negative conditions, either in the physical body or the mind, they showed the way of optimal evolution of both body and mind. Here now words from the book of hymns. I have reached the inner vision and through thy spirit in me I have heard thy wondrous secret. Through thy mystic insight thou hast caused a spring of knowledge to well up within me. A fountain of power pouring forth living waters. A flood of love and of all embracing wisdom like the splendor of eternal light. When an individual from outside of the order asks to be admitted and after the verification of certain aptitudes for the inner life, the candidate had to practice a kind of meditation. In complete calm, he examined his past life clearly in order to arrive at an objective summary of it with the successes, failures, motivations, vibrations, experience, and the wisdom acquired. He had to discern the impulses which he had received from heaven and from his angel during his childhood and throughout his life and look at how he had responded. Had he moved away from them or had he remained faithful? Through this analysis, a new bond with the higher world of free spirit could be forged. And the candidate was led to discover his own mistakes, the cause of all of his suffering. In this way, he could bring about changes within himself, take control of his life and prepare himself effectively and in full awareness to enter the community of light. 
After his initiation, which made him a full-fledged brother or sister of the community, the newcomer received simultaneously with his white linen robe a mission to be accomplished during this life. This mission had to be a goal, an orientation, which must never leave him or her, and which was a way of uniting them with God, making them useful to the earth and to humanity. He was never to stray from conducting this mission, following the thread of that mission. This is what gave a positive meaning to his or her passage on earth and made him or her a true human being. For the school to be a man, a woman, was to carry inside of themselves a beautiful light to be offered to the earth, to its inhabitants, to oneself. The white robe was a materialization of the power of this baptism and purity of soul, which had to protect them from the many contradictions of the world. The staff or cane, which also was received on this occasion, symbolized the knowledge of the secret laws of life and their ability to use them harmoniously for the successful accomplishment <coughs> of their task. The initiate was also required to take an oath to respect the earth as a living, sacred, intelligent being in order to maintain contact with it, to honor it, to participate in its healthy evolution. He or she had to be in contact with the ground through their feet, sometimes through their whole body. This is why the Essenes often went barefoot. One had to be at least 21 years old in order to receive this initiation. In order to fulfill this particular mission, the brother or sister often had to surpass themselves, to question themselves, to obtain the assistance of Holy Spirit. They were given techniques to help them. For example, they had to examine themselves and observe themselves often Every thought, every feeling, every action, and its motivations had to be clearly outlined in black and white. Then it had to be determined if the idea of the mission, the high ideal, was the source. The Essene masters knew from experience how quickly one could stray from the path of light and get lost, unable to find the road again. The necessity to purify oneself constantly by washing one's feet, hands, and body was very important to the Essenes. They cleansed themselves physically and spiritually before entering someone's house at the beginning, at the end of the day, and before eating or praying. They also watch, washed each other's feet as a sign of friendship and to cultivate the idea that they must take care of one another. They also blessed one another by laying their hands on the top of the head in order to be always united with the light and to reinforce the love which flowed among them. The rules of life, the very strict discipline which went with them were not a constraint but were freely accepted as ways to forge character, to develop one's highest being. The Essenes <coughs> received many teachings of the ancient universal wisdom which they had to bring to life inside themselves as a sacred service to humanity. They were fully aware that the major part of this wisdom was for future humanity. And they thought that the great masters would come in the future and make use of their work. They believed that without them, the masters, the benefactors, would not be able to help human beings, and that people would therefore sink into the darkness and ignorance and depravity that is seen so often around us, and eventually destroy one another through wars and other unspeakable atrocities. The technique of a scene initiation consisted in plunging deep inside oneself, to find again the source of divine existence, which then allowed one to recognize in the inner level and also around in the outer level, the living and divine water which animates everything. It is this state of mind voluntarily cultivated that opened up the doors of the spiritual worlds to them. Thus, an Essene was conscious of belonging to a people, a tradition, a lineage. It is only when he or she felt themselves in harmony with this lineage that they could really find their place and fulfillment as an individual and as a community. And Essene could not reach fulfillment outside the lineage of light. Whatever he did in his or her individual life had to be linked to the global task. Some cultivated the soil, others were craftsmen, others therapists, teachers, but all of them worked in one way or another <coughs> for the good of all. I end now with a last reading from the Essenes, from the 
thanksgiving psalm of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I am grateful, Heavenly Father, for Thou hast raised me to an eternal height, and I walk in the wonders of the plain. Thou gavest me guidance to reach Thine eternal company from the depths of the earth. Thou hast purified my body to join the army of the angels of the earth and my spirit to reach the congregation of the heavenly angels. Thou gavest man eternity to praise at dawn and dusk thy works and wonders in joyful song. You have now been introduced to the Essenes, to this lineage of teaching and of love, of conscious love has been part of our world, though we know it not, for so long. Thank you. Well, see, that's the interesting part. The study of the scenes shows that from the beginning, from the dawn of time, there has been these, these connections, these perennial teachings that filter through different groups at different times, but are linked to something beyond time and space. So the Gnostics picked up elements of the Essenes, the Christians did, and that which feeds the human soul is awakened by these things in every generation through different forms. But the content is often very similar. I, Kurt, and I'm guessing you came in a little late because we had a long section on that and you're talking about Akhenaten, so-called heretic pharaoh in the 18th dynasty who got rid of all of the rituals and the images of the gods of his culture to worship the Aton, the Aten, the energy of the sun, which he understood to be the true nature of the formless god. So Akhenaten was a guiding force in that tradition. Oh, there's always more, <laughs> if people are interested. That's right. This is a beginning because it's from the ancient origins, something to stir the mind. And if anyone here is worried or disturbed about how that impacts Christianity, don't be. Ask a question, you'll find out. The value here of these teachings is to see that it didn't just all begin with a people in a desert that they carried with them something that was universal, not ethnic, not national, not just for them. And in limited ways they expressed it until it was fully expressed. For those of us who recognize it in the one we call Jesus the Christ, so even though it is different, it is outside of tradition, it is only a reinforcement that what Christians believe, what is at the heart of these teachings is universal truth connected to all that is true, to all the intuitions of humanity and brought to their apex by the one we call Lord. It isn't one over another. It isn't one instead of another. It allows us to expand our view, to open our mind and to find it in all kinds of places. That's the great value of this. It is only when one wants to keep it in a box with familiar labels that it becomes threatening or scary. But there is more to come, of course, because it isn't just interesting history or interesting archaeology. It is the personal search for that which frees the soul, opens the mind, connects you with the sacred, with the deepest purposes of your life. And that's a longer conversation. Some of you are hearing it up in the sanctuary, but there are other ways to hear it, other words to use for it. But all of it is meant to feed that part of you that uh, hungers for something deeper and knows there's more to life than the secular and the material. Yes, that issue of slavery is phenomenal. This was the first people ever anywhere that totally rejected slavery. 
And that's an amazing thing. They had equality with men and women, which is also astonishing. We're talking, you know, two, three thousand years ago now. And part of our encounter with the Middle East, say the Taliban, reveals to us how close to home some of those ancient mindsets still are. So they were a radical break from how everybody thought. And that makes them very interesting, don't you think? They tuned into something way ahead of their times. You mentioned the teaching from Paul. You might have picked up in passing. I admit I was reading a little quickly. I thought you were falling asleep maybe out there. That there were some differences in the text. It isn't all one harmonious thing. Uh, so that Paul speaks of justified by faith, James says by works. If you want to put all that together, come and join us on Sunday mornings. We'll work it out with you. But there were some uh, different understandings. However, I would suggest to you that that issue of slaves, you know, obey your masters, wasn't necessarily about supporting slavery as much as it was about find peace within your soul no matter what. And as a fellow Christian, who among his fellow Christians is no longer a slave, but a, a brother or sister, you find a means to live fully in spite of what the culture is doing to you. I believe that's what that was about, uh, more than simply a, uh, an acceptance of the issue of slavery. That other question about a mother, father, God is also very interesting. You see, just as radical as the slavery issue, you find that the Essenes had that balanced, holistic understanding, which did get lost, especially in the Middle Ages, when everyone was exposed to these harsh images of a masculine, judgmental God. And I would point out to you that one of the reasons Mary becomes so important to Christians of that time, to Catholics, was because it was the feminine element missing in the sense they had of the divine. 